Have you heard of levers or lever systems? Leverage is a concept commonly covered in physics and biomechanics courses. But even if you don't know the specific mathematical formulas, you know the way leverage works. Force is applied to an arm, called a lever, in conjunction with a fixed point called a fulcrum. Lever systems have been used throughout history to gain a mechanical advantage and enhance the power or speed of a movement, such as to move heavy objects with a wheelbarrow, or is used in a tool like a pry bar, a bottle opener, or the oar of a boat. This concept of leverage is also used in a teeter-totter or seesaw at a child's playground or by skateboarders in some of their moves. Our joints and their movements are also examples of leverage systems. Here, the bones serve as the levers. They are the elongated and inflexible parts of the system that move around a joint, which is the fixed point or fulcrum. To get movement in the leverage system, the effort applied to one end of the lever has to overcome the resistance or load at the other end. In the body, the effort is the force generated by muscle activity, since bones and joints can't move themselves. The resistance is the weight of the body part distal to the fulcrum and any added weight on that body part, like a dumbbell in your hand or a heavy box that you're carrying. There are different types of levers called first, second, and third class systems, so the pattern is not always as simple as in a seesaw. But that's an easy example to illustrate the point. If we use the elbow as an example, the hinge-like joint between the humerus and the ulna is the fulcrum. The effort or force needed to flex the elbow, that means to bend it, is provided by some anterior muscles of the upper arm, proximal to the elbow. The resistance or load the effort must overcome to achieve movement is the weight of the forearm and hand as well as anything in the hand. So the reason weight lifting builds muscles is that we increase the resistance or load by putting a dumbbell in our hand, which means that the effort or force provided by the muscle must also increase if the load is to be moved. Now this increased weight in the lever system strengthens and builds up the muscle. And by the way, we don't add more muscle cells. We simply increase the number of protein strands called myofilaments within the existing muscle cells, which in turn adds bulk to and strengthens the muscle. That's why a good diet with plenty of protein is also essential to build muscle tissue. Now let's get more specific and use some hardware models to help illustrate how interrelated the structure of a joint is with its specific functions. There are essentially six main types of joints based on the shapes of articulating bones and as a result of that anatomy, the range of motion they allow. These joint types and their motions vary from simple gliding movements of flat surfaces against each other to angular movements like at the elbow where the distance between the bones changes through a range of motion as well as other elbow joint actions like rotation. There are six main categories of freely movable synovial joints based on their structure, presented here to some degree from simple to complex in their movements. Plane or planar joints are articulations in which a pair of relatively flat bone surfaces simply slide against each other like when using a sanding block against a wooden surface. Since the articulating surfaces never leave each other, they just slide back and forth, these joints don't allow as much movement as many other joint types, but they're still diarthrotic synovial joints. We'll see these types of planar joints between the tarsal bones of the ankle and foot and between the carpal bones of the wrist. Pivot or rotational joints work like a trailer hitch. Like planar joints, the surfaces don't really leave each other so much as one surface rotates inside a circular or semicircular surface made by the other bone. 
For this reason, they're known as monoaxial joints, since movement is in a single plane. We'll see this type of articulation at the part of the elbow joint where the radius joins the humerus, allowing us to rotate our forearm, palm up and palm down. We'll also see a pivot joint between the first two vertebrae of the neck, allowing us to rotate our head left and right. We've already mentioned hinge joints in which the articulating bones physically resemble a door or cabinet hinge. These are also monoaxial joints that allow movement in a single plane, so only in two directions, like back and forth, similar to the way a door moves. Besides the hinge joint between the humerus and ulna at the elbow, the knees are hinge joints, as are the interphalangeal joints between bones in the fingers, which are called phalanges. Condyloid or ellipsoidal joints allow a joystick-like movement between a concave oval surface and a matching convex oval surface. A good example of that is between the radius of the forearm and a couple of the carpal bones of the wrist, or between the metacarpals of the palm of the hand and the proximal phalanges of the fingers. The corresponding oval ends of the bones nest in each other like spoons in a drawer. These condyloid or ellipsoidal joints, you'll hear both terms used in musculoskeletal anatomy, are biaxial joints because the movement occurs in two planes. Saddle joints are relatively rare articulations in which one bone resembles a saddle and the other a rider in that saddle. The best example of this is where the base of the thumb meets the wrist. This is where the metacarpal bone in the thumb side of the palm joins the lateralmost carpal of the wrist, called the trapezium, due to its shape. Saddle joints are biaxial as they allow movement in more than one direction. This is one reason the thumb is such a special feature of primates. This prehensile grasping thumb allows that grasping motion characteristic of primate hands like ours. The last, but certainly not the least category of synovial joints by structure are ball and socket joints. These are what are known as multi-axial joints because they allow movement in all three dimensions as in an x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis. These joints allow the greatest range of motion, a complexity of movement that is only possible at our shoulder and hip joints, the ball and socket joints in the human body. Hardware models are good schematic representations of the six main types of joints by structure, but I use another model in the classroom to illustrate the main types of movement possible at a joint. Take a pencil and put it on a flat surface, like a piece of blank paper, if you wish. If you don't feel like getting up and, hey, this is a course about movement, you can use your index finger on one hand as a substitute for the pencil and use the palm of your other hand to represent the flat plane. The spot where your pencil or finger is touching the plane represents the joint, which in the leverage system was the fulcrum, the place where the two bones meet. Gliding movements would be represented by sliding your pencil or finger on that flat surface, like making a little X or a T, without altering the angle between the tip of the pencil or your finger and that flat surface. To simulate rotational movements, spin the pencil or your finger against the flat plane. This is how rotational joints work. One bone rotates against the other, but the angle between the bones doesn't change. They stay in the same plane. And the movement is said to be monoaxial since the rotation is occurring along that single plane. Now, angular motions work like a switch or a joystick. The angle between the two participating bones changes. So keep the pencil or your finger against the flat surface but move it, move it back and forth or right to left, like flipping a switch or pulling a lever. Hinge joints work like this, but in either a simple forward and back pattern or a right to left pattern, not in both of those planes. So they're monoaxial joints. 
However, condyloid joints have multiple directions for their angular movements. So are biaxial joints with two planes of movement, like a joystick that moves back and forth as well as side to side. Now, ball and socket joints move in multiple directions and can rotate as well. As we'll see when discussing the shoulder and the hip, these type of joints move in all three dimensions. Sometimes the term circumduction is used for movement in an arc, like standing with your shoulder toward a chalkboard and then drawing a large circle on the board. But really, when you think about it, that's just an ever-changing series of angular movements in a sequence. Ball and socket joints can do even more than that. They combine these multi-directional angular movements with rotational movements as well, thus picking up all three axes or dimensions, so are called multi-axial joints. Now, let's cover the terminology for these forward and back and side-to-side -side movements using more specific language, along with some particular joints as examples of places where these movements occur. As with the terms forward and back, these motions often come in pairs, much like we saw with directional term opposites like anterior and posterior, or proximal and distal. We'll also need to bring back standard anatomical position, which has the spine and limbs straight, since these straight lines of anatomical position are also the standard reference positions of joints from which movements are made. Let's start with flexion and extension, which are easy to understand in limbs. Flexion is bending, such as at the elbow or knee, and extension returns us to anatomical position. With regard to the joints within limbs, flexion always decreases the angle between the articulating bones. So I'm flexing at the elbow, at the wrist, and at the fingers, since all these angles decrease. Extension increases the angle between the articulating bones, bringing us back to anatomical position. Now notice that, in a sense, our knees and elbows are on backward, in that during flexion at the elbow, the direction of movement is anterior, while it's posterior at the knee. This is due to the rotation that occurs in the lower limb during the development of vertebrates, that is, animals with a backbone, which we'll talk about more with the lower limb. However, this angular movement is similar at the ball and socket joints of the shoulder and hip, where forward is flexion in both. I tell my students to remember F and F, forward equals flexion at ball and socket joints, and extension is a posterior movement, restoring us to standard anatomical position, regardless of upper or lower limb. But once you're within the limb, flexion always decreases the angle of the two bones at the joint. Now, flexion of the spine is a forward bend, whether only at the neck or whether touching your toes. But we can also do a side bend or move the ear towards the shoulder, which is specifically called lateral flexion of the spine. Extension is returning to a straight spine as in anatomical position. Sometimes the term hyperextension is used for a movement beyond anatomical position. But that depends on the source. Some books will reserve hyperextension only for positions that go beyond the normal range of motion, like people who can slightly hyperextend at their elbows. Now, there's no absolute standard there. For instance, it's pretty common to call looking up at the ceiling or up at the stars hyperextension of the neck while we use extension of the wrist for the complete range of motion possible there, beyond anatomical position. Now, some sources even use the term extension for any movement in the opposite direction of flexion and reserve hyperextension for pathological states, maybe following an injury. Another angular movement pair are abduction and adduction which are possible at ball and socket joints, but also at condyloid joints like the wrist and the knuckle joints between the fingers and palms. In anatomy and physiology, especially in the musculoskeletal courses and clinical courses my physical therapy students take, 
you'll hear these said as abduction and adduction, since it's often hard to hear the difference in those terms, especially when coming out of the mouth of a fast speaker like me. Abduction takes the body part away from the midline, and adduction brings it back toward the midline of the body. Those words are helpful since if someone is abducted, they are taken away, while adduction adds the body part back to the midline. I should also mention that some body parts can have their own midline for abduction and adduction. For example, with regard to the hands, the middle finger is the axis for abduction and adduction with reference to movements of the fingers. Now in class, this is when I usually get to give my students the middle finger and tell them it's not often we teachers get to do that to the class. That always gets a laugh. And the special term, horizontal abduction, is used for taking an outstretched upper limb from pointing straight ahead out to the side. Also, remember that abduction and adduction are not possible at the hinge joints of the elbow or knee, since those are monoaxial joints and move in only an anterior and posterior direction related to anatomical position. In the arc-like movement called circumduction, which only happens at ball and socket joints, we're really just combining a series of angular motions. We start that circuit with flexion, and then we gradually abduct away from the body, and then we move into extension until we finally adduct back toward the body, returning us to anatomical position. That's different from rotational movements, such as happen at pivot joints. So let's look at true rotational movements. There's a pivot joint between our first and second vertebra of the spine that looks and functions like a trailer hitch. The second cervical vertebra has a projection that sticks up, and the first cervical vertebra, with the skull on top of it, rotates around that projection, giving us a much greater side-to-side -side range of motion of our head than at other places in the spine. Rotational movement also happens at the elbow, specifically at the part of the elbow joint between the radius and the humerus. The elbow is quite a complex joint since three bones articulate there. The humerus of the upper arm articulates with both the radius and ulna of the forearm. Now, the joint between the ulna and the humerus is the hinge joint we've spoken of, while the one between the radius and the humerus is a pivot joint. Perhaps because our upper limbs are so important to our daily lives, there's a special name given to the rotational movement between the humerus and the radius. Supination is the term for palm forward, like an anatomical position, and pronation is the opposite term for when the palm is turned backward, or should I say posteriorly. I teach my students this memory trick. You could hold a bowl of soup in a supinated hand, but if you turn that hand over, you're prone to drop the soup. Remember, as was mentioned in the first lesson, supine and prone are also used for positions on a surgical table, a gurney, or on the floor at a crime scene. Supine is belly up and prone is face down. And while those aren't movements, they are deviations from anatomical position and come from the same word roots as supination and pronation of the elbow. As I pronate and supinate, you really see the movement at the wrist and hand, but it's actually happening at the elbow. Now we'll cover all these specifics of the joints when we get to their section of the course, and I'll remind you of this terminology then as well. Other rotational movements happen at ball and socket joints. In the lower limbs, inward, internal, or medial rotation is performed when pointing the toes toward the midline, while lateral, outward, or external rotation is the act of pointing the toes out toward the sides. The knee really can't do that kind of rotation. That action is happening at the ball and socket joint of the hip. Same with the shoulder. Moving my forearm and hand toward my body is inward or medial rotation, while swinging my forearm and hand out to the side is lateral or outward rotation. 
Both are happening at the shoulder joint, but it's easiest to see with a flexed elbow to avoid confusing or mistaking that action with supination and pronation at the elbow. Now, just as pronation and supination are particular to the elbow, some other movements are specific to only a selected joint. There's a special set of movements of the foot known as inversion and eversion. Inversion refers to directing the sole of the foot toward the midline, while everting the foot directs the sole of the foot outward, away from the body. These are often said to happen at the ankle, but as we'll see later, these movements actually happen within the foot itself, not between the leg and foot at the ankle joint. Now the special actions that do happen at the true ankle joint are a pair of movements called dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion means pointing the toes toward the ceiling, like walking on your heels, and this happens at the hinge joint of the ankle. Plantar flexion is the opposite movement that points your toes downward toward the floor, like standing on your tiptoes. As I tell my students, you dorsiflex your ankle to move from the gas pedal to the brake, and then you plantar flex your foot to press down on the brake pedal. The true ankle joint is a hinge joint, while it's a series of gliding joints within the foot that allow the movements of inversion and eversion. Protraction and retraction are a set of movement classifications that occur at a limited number of joints. Protraction means to protrude a body part, pushing it anteriorly, while retraction is the opposite, pulling that body part back to anatomical position or pulling it in a posterior direction. An example of this is seen at the shoulders with the scapula or shoulder blade and with the clavicles, commonly called collarbones. You protract your scapulae when you push your shoulders forward and you retract them when you pull them together posteriorly, like when correcting poor posture. The joint where the jaw meets the rest of the skull is another place where protraction and retraction occur. Protraction pushes the jaw forward while retraction pulls it back into its normal orientation. As we'll see, the jaw joint where the mandible connects to the rest of the skull is a little more complicated. It's a gliding joint that allows protraction, retraction, and even side-to-side -side gliding movements, but it's also a hinge joint that's al that allows us to open and close the mouth, which is called depression and elevation of the mandible. Like the joint at the jaw, the scapulae of the shoulder girdle can also elevate and depress. When you shrug your shoulders, you're elevating your scapulae and the clavicles that connect to them. And then you can also depress the shoulder girdle, bringing the shoulders down away from your ears. Lastly, let's consider the hand. Remember the saddle joint I mentioned between the thumb and one of the carpals of the wrist? That allows a pretty remarkable ability of primates, like monkeys, apes, and humans, to oppose their thumb to their other fingers. This makes for what is known as a prehensile hand or grasping hand, an exceptional feature that is one of the hallmarks of our species and which enables our ability to make and use tools. Opposition is the term for that movement of the thumb, and reposition is the opposite of opposition. I couldn't resist saying that just for fun. We'll talk about other thumb motions when we cover the hand. In fact, we will learn more about other specific movements possible at a whole variety of diarthrotic synovial joints in the body. As we cover each body region, we'll go into the specific bony landmarks and their shapes, which allow particular movements at a given joint and don't allow others. We'll learn about the ligaments that restrict movement in a given direction and help stabilize the joint while still facilitating movement. We'll also learn which joints have articular discs and occasionally discuss some of their bursae. And when we get to those specifics, we'll return to the terminology of movement we used in this lesson and gain a deeper understanding of the relationship between structure and function. Another thing we'll cover in future lessons
are various clinical correlations that I hope will help us better understand normal structure and function, as well as illustrate the ways in which trauma and pathology can negatively affect our movement and our musculoskeletal health. I hope it will also add interest to consider dysfunction when we cover specific bones, joints, muscles, and nerves. It certainly seems to pique the interest of my students. While we're on this topic, I'd like to add something interesting to think about regarding joints. Of all of the elements of the musculoskeletal system, joints are the only components that are readily and frequently replaced by artificial substitutes known as prosthetic joints. When a joint is worn out, a person might be a good candidate for arthroplasty. That's the medical term for the surgical installation of a prosthetic joint. I bet every one of us knows someone, and likely multiple people, who have had joint replacement surgery. Recent estimates indicate that each year in the U.S. alone, there are about 700,000 knee replacements and about 400,000 total hip replacements. One source suggests, quote, total joint arthroplasty is one of the most cost-effective and successful interventions in medicine. The history of joint replacement surgery goes back to the 1800s in the United States but so-called total joint replacements didn't begin until about the 1970s. Now, some of us may remember the TV series from the 70s called The Six Million Dollar Man. Well, we used to call my dad the bionic man because of that show. Dad had an autoimmune condition that greatly affected his joints and range of motion. So starting in the 1970s, he began getting a series of joint replacement surgeries that spanned over 20 years. This even included a pair of prosthetic wrist joints that were experimental at the time and eventually had to be removed. In those days, there were many limitations on how long the replacements might last, and different body sizes and patients weren't so easily accommodated. Some of the early models were one-size-fits-all. Since then, rates of joint replacements have grown steadily with many refinements in styles, durability, and success. These have given some of our family members, friends, and perhaps even us, restored range of motion and a more pain-free lifestyle. I recall my dad saying after his for first knee replacement, some days everything on me hurts except for my new knee. And dad also gained a great respect for physical therapists and was thrilled when I began teaching anatomy to them. This is because following arthroplasty, PTs and other clinicians step in to teach a patient how to safely return to function using their artificial joint, including what movements they can and should do to rehabilitate, as well as which motions the patient should avoid, especially while healing. Of course, that's not the only time people participate in physical therapy. PTs are experts in restoring range of motion in all types of musculoskeletal issues. In fact, some of the basic practices of physical therapists are actually called range of motion activities and might be employed long before a joint replacement surgery or help stall or even prevent the need for arthroplasty. Now, these can be broken down into subgroups, such as passive and active range of motion exercises. So let's close by talking about a few of these to reinforce some of the joint movement terminology from this lesson. In passive range of motion exercises, the clinician moves a patient's body parts when they cannot, whether the patient is immobile from paralysis or other pathology. This hands-on therapy helps loosen stiff joints, relaxes tense connective tissues, and stretches muscles to guide them hopefully back to normal function. But in active range of motion physical therapy, the PT directs the patient to move their body, even if simply starting in bed after surgery. This might involve doing ankle pumps by repeated dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, or heel slides where the person keeps their heel on the bed but then alternates between flexion and extension of the knee. 
Moving up to the hip, the therapist might have the patient alternate between abduction and adduction of the hip joints by sliding a lower limb laterally and then bringing it back medially. By working from the feet to the knees and then the hips, even a person who is bedridden can get blood flow moving and keep their muscles engaged. This will hopefully get the person back on their feet faster and out of the hospital quicker after an injury or following surgery. I'm sure plenty of us have benefited from physical therapy to improve range of motion or restore strength to an injured or recovering body part. Restoring or gaining range of motion isn't limited to physical therapy, of course. I'm sure many of us have participated in yoga or general stretching to improve the function of our joints and build strength in our muscles. So now let's move to our next lesson and examine how muscles or their tendons cross our joints and cause them to move.